Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are doing the ADES model. This model has been introduced to you in your principles of macro. It's the benchmark model for explaining business cycle fluctuations. So the model that we're going to discuss today is going to be very similar to what you have probably seen in your principles of macro or introductory economic courses. However, this one is what we call the dynamic ADES model. So it is slightly different in the sense that now we are not going to draw a response of aggregate output demanded or aggregate output supplied against price level, but rather how these to respond to inflation. So our first component of the model is our AD. Aggregate demand is made up of four main components. That is your consumption spending of all households in our economy. Then we have planned investment spending. That is total planned spending by businesses on new machines, factories, and other capital goods, plus any spending on new homes. Next, we have government purchases. Again, this is spending by all levels of the government on final goods and services produced in this economy. Lastly, we have net exports. That is the net foreign spending spending of foreigners on domestically produced goods and services. So we have exports minus imports over here. So these are the four main components of AD. And now we want to see how does AD overall or aggregate output demanded respond to inflation rate. Now we know AD curve will be downward sloping because typically we see spending on goods and services, whether it's by households, firms, government or foreigners tends to go down higher is the inflation rate. So if our prices are going up, inflation rate is rising. These goods are now relatively more expensive and overall spending will go down. That's one reason for your AD to be downward sloping. The second Second reason comes from our conduct of monetary policy. We know that your central bank is going to respond to changes in the inflation rate and Taylor principle is ideal for understanding this. Now the Taylor principle teaches that this nominal interest rate is going to increase by more than the increase in inflation and thereby ensuring real interest rates go up. So we have inflation rising, nominal interest rates rising by more than that causing the real interest rate going up. This is your automatic response of monetary policy and that causes your aggregate output demanded to go down. Now, as you can see, overall, we again have this negative relationship between these two and that is our second reason for our downward sloping demand curve. So if I was to draw my AD, we have now inflation rate over here, aggregate output demanded on the x-axis and I have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Next, let's look at the factors that cause the aggregate demand to increase or decrease. Now aggregate demand will increase when the aggregate output demanded is higher at any given inflation rate. Likewise aggregate demand decreases when the aggregate output demanded is lower at any given inflation rate. So changes in any of these factors over here will cause our overall aggregate demand to increase or decrease. So let's go over them briefly. Autonomous consumption expenditure is a part of your consumption spending that does not depend upon your income. So when autonomous consumption spending goes up, we see aggregate output demanded going up at any given inflation rate and therefore the aggregate demand curve increases or shifts to the right. Autonomous investment spending, so that its planned investment spending goes up and that will cause again your aggregate output demanded to increase at any given inflation rate and push your AD to the right again. Government purchases, so government is running a deficit, increases its government spending, it increases G and causes aggregate output demanded to increase at any given inflation rate and pushes again your AD to the right. Higher taxes are going to reduce spending by households or by businesses, whichever sector of the economy is seeing this increase in taxes and therefore AD is going to now decrease or shift to the left. Autonomous net exports. So if net spending on our domestically produced goods and services by foreigners increases at any given inflation rate, that again causes aggregate demand to increase. Financial frictions refer to your asymmetric information problems like adverse selection and moral hazard. Higher the financial frictions we have in our credit markets, lower will be our planned investment spending and therefore lower will be our aggregate demand. So AD is now decreasing or shifting to the left. Last I have over here autonomous changes in monetary policy. Now this is not automatic changes in your monetary policy like the one we discussed earlier and when we were looking at the shape of the AD curve. This is now when your real interest rate changes at any given inflation rate. So this is not in response to inflation rate but rather at any given inflation rate when there is autonomous tightening of monetary policy that is real interest rate is now going up it will cause AD to decrease or shift to the left. 
and autonomous monetary policy easing would be when at any given inflation rate when real interest rates are going down and this stimulates our consumption investment net exports because the canadian dollar will also become cheaper aggregate demand will increase and shift to the right so automatic responses in monetary policy which are coming from change in inflation and then responding to that cause a downward movement along the ad curve whereas autonomous changes in monetary policy will be a shift of the ad curve depending upon whether it's monetary tightening or autonomous monetary policy easing. In terms of the diagram, whenever at any given inflation rate we have aggregate output demanded increasing, it is a shift to the right. So we have a new set of coordinate points and that is an increase to the right. And likewise at any given inflation rate, if our aggregate output demanded decreases, that would cause a shift to the left. Note that it is for taxes, financial frictions, and real interest rate autonomous monetary policy tightening when these three go up ad will actually decrease let's now look at our supply side of the economy on the supply side we have two different curves that we have to look at one is the long run aggregate supply curve and then we'll focus on the short run aggregate supply curve long run aggregate supply curve is simply determined by your amount of capital in the economy the total stock of labor that we have and the available technology it will be vertical at the output level that is generated at your natural rate of unemployment so this is your potential level of gdp determined by your capital labor available technology and this will be corresponding to the underlying natural rate of unemployment in this economy natural rate of unemployment Unemployment, remember is equal to frictional plus structural so your unemployment never goes to zero there's always some unemployment in the economy even if the economy is producing at its potential level now this ag long run aggregate supply does not respond to any changes in inflation rate so whether inflation is 12 percent or four percent your long run potential does not change because of changing inflation therefore if i was to draw it against inflation it will always remain vertical at the level of potential gdp now let's look at our short run aggregate supply curve here we'll see a positive relationship between aggregate output supplied and inflation rate and you will have an upward sloping aggregate supply curve now there are three main reasons that drive inflation first one is your expected inflation output gap and the last one is your supply shocks also referred to as inflation shocks this first one is telling us that workers will always respond to higher expectations of inflation if they expect higher inflation in the future they're going to push for higher nominal wage and this increase in nominal wage would be a one-to-one -one increase with the expected inflation rate so the real wage does not change we do not want our purchasing power to go down now wage is one of the most important costs of production for firms and businesses and therefore overall inflation will also rise along with the increase in expected inflation. Therefore, we see expectations of inflation will drive up overall inflation also. Secondly, we see that the output gap is going to cause inflation to go up or inflation to go down. Output gap refers to the deviation of actual output from its potential level. So if output gap is positive, output is above potential, that means the economy does not have a lot of slack. Labor market is quite tight. With the tight labor market, wages are going to go up. In expectation of that, firms are also going to increase their prices rapidly and drive inflation up. So whenever output is above potential, inflation is also going to be driven up. Likewise, if output is below potential, now your labor market has a lot of slack in it. There's a lot of unemployment and workers are now more willing to have smaller increases in their wages and that will drive inflation rate down. So whenever we have positive output gap, inflation tends to go up and for recessionary output gaps, inflation tends to go down. Thirdly, we have supply shocks that drive inflation. So in this case, you have some good or service whose supply has suddenly gone up or gone down, that will cause changes in our inflation rate. So for example, in the 1970s, we had consecutive oil shocks because of the Arab-Israel conflict. And because oil is a major commodity used in production processes, price of oil shot up and it caused inflationary pressures in the world economy. So we could have a major commodity becoming much more expensive, driving up inflation in our economy. Life shocks can also arise when workers push for wages over and above the productivity gains by firms. And that again, will drive up inflation. Oil price shocks, also referred to as energy inflation shocks, can also occur when there's an increase in demand. For example, we saw a huge increase in demand for oil for coming from China in 2007-2008, again driving up inflation. Supply shocks or inflation shocks, remember, overall occur when there are shocks to the supply of goods and services produced in the economy that translate into 
inflation shocks that is shifts in inflation that are independent of amount of slack in the economy or expected inflation if i put overall all of these three factors together in order to see how inflation is driven by these three factors we get the following equation now you can see inflation in this equation is driven by our expectations of inflation it is driven by output gaps and lastly it is driven by supply or inflation shocks this gamma over here which is the coefficient of the output gap is telling us the sensitivity of inflation to the output gap higher the value of this coefficient the more sensitive will be our current inflation to output gap now we can use this equation to see why is our short-term aggregate supply curve upward sloping so let's assume there are no supply shocks and the output gap is zero and let's assume expectations of inflation is at two percent so this tells us when output is at potential inflation is at its expected level this gives us point one on this diagram so you can see at point one output is at potential two trillion dollars and inflation is at its expected level if output gap is positive and so let's assume output increases to 2.2 trillion dollars over here this equation is telling me that inflation will also rise 2 plus some number over here will give me a higher level of inflation let's assume with a positive output gap this gives us an inflation rate of 3.5 percent so that gives me 0.2 on my panel which is showing that at output of 2.2 trillion dollars inflation is now higher than 2 percent and we're assuming that to be 3.5 percent connecting the two dots we see our upward sloping short-term aggregate supply curve this supply curve is simply telling us that as output rises above potential the labor market is tighter and firms raise their prices at a more rapid rate causing the inflation rate to also rise and thus our aggregate supply curve is upward sloping simply put we are saying that firms are availing the opportunity to increase their production sell it at a higher price in the short run now in the short run remember wages tend to be sticky and the stickiness of the wages will be given to us by the value of our coefficient gamma so higher the value of gamma the more flexible wages are so inflation will respond very quickly to output gaps and lower the value of gamma wages tend to be more sticky now and inflation will respond but not by as much in the face of inflationary gaps so bigger the value of gamma the more steeper will be your short-term aggregate supply curve lower the value of gamma the more flatter will be your aggregate supply curve if wages are fully flexible short-term aggregate supply curve becomes vertical now that we know the shape of the two curves the long run aggregate supply and the short run aggregate supply curve now let's focus on the shifters for these two curves so remember long run aggregate supply was determined by the stock of capital labor technology and your natural rate of unemployment these four together generate a potential level of gdp at any particular point in time so if any of these factors change your potential will also change and thereby give you a higher or a smaller level of potential gdp so for example if the total amount of capital in the economy increases it's going to generate a higher level of potential GDP and therefore your long run aggregate supply curve increases or shifts to the right natural remember is made up of frictional and structural rate of unemployment frictional unemployment refers to the job search time involved and structural unemployment can rise from wages being stuck at a very high level so if we have high minimum wages very strong labor unions that push the wage rate up we will have some structural unemployment these structural reasons and frictional unemployment can change over time so if over time we see a decline in the natural rate it will generate a higher level of potential gdp and therefore we will have a long run aggregate supply curve which is increasing or shifting to the right of course any of them moving in the opposite direction will cause your long run aggregate supply curve to decrease and thereby shift to the left so in my next diagram you're just showing that if potential increases because of any of those factors like capital labor technology or the fall in your natural rate we see potential gdp rising to 2.2 trillion dollars in this hypothetical example now let's look at what causes the shifters in our short run aggregate supply curve if our expectations of inflation go up holding everything else constant so output is still at potential there are no supply shocks then at the same point we are now working with a higher level of expectation of inflation so it will shift our short run aggregate supply curve up and to the left note in our previous diagram our short run as was drawn with the expectation that inflation is at two percent output was at potential at point one and now with the same gdp at potential we have seen an increase in our expectations of inflation so that was going to cause the short run as to shift up and to the left second one is your inflation shocks so if holding again everything else constant output is again at potential 
expectation of inflation is not changing. We are still working with the same expectation of inflation of 2%. But now there's a supply shock. So there's an oil price shock like we saw in the 1970s, or it could be because of wages being driven up. Again, we see that for the same level of production at potential at point one, a supply shock is going to cause our actual inflation to go up and therefore S curve shifts up and to the left. So upward shift in the supply curve is indicating that we're working with now a higher level of inflation. Also remember that for the supply curve, this upward shift is also equivalent to a decline in actual output produced. So whenever the supply curve shifts up, it's actually telling us that production has gone down. Firms are reducing their production at any given inflation rate. Lastly, we have a persistent output gap. So we know typically that an output gap drives up the inflation and gives us that upward sloping supply curve. But if the output gap is persistent, we'll see that it is causing actually a shift in the supply curve. So over here, I have my initial point at one, output is at potential, inflation is at 2%, and we're also expecting inflation to be at 2%. There are no supply shocks and there is no output gap. Now, if we have an output gap, so let's say there's a positive output gap, output increases from 2 to $2.2 trillion. We know from our understanding of the upward slope of the short-run AS that firms are going to increase their prices very rapidly in the face of this output gap, and that is going to drive up our inflation rate. So we are at now 0.2. From 1 to 2, it's simply a movement along the aggregate supply curve. Now, the next part is understanding the fact that this is a persistent output gap. So if this output gap remains over here, what is it going to do to our expectations of inflation? A positive output gap is going to drive our expectations of inflation up. Why? Because the, your labor market is now quite tight, wages are going to be driven up, and in anticipation of wages being driven up, expectations of inflation are also being driven up. And as expectations of inflation now change, this is going to cause our short-run AS to decrease or shift up to reflect that higher expectation of inflation. Note my AS2 is now passing through this point over here where the expectation of inflation is 3.5% and it is corresponding to the inflation rate that we observed at point two. At point two, because of the output gap, inflation had increased to 3.5. So our new short-run AS2 is constructed after adjusting for the fact that inf inflation is not 2%, it's actually higher, and therefore we adjust our expectations of inflation upwards. Now again, if the output gap is persistent, we are at point three, and at point three, actual inflation is 5%, and not 3.5%. So that is again going to drive inflation of expectations further up and push our short-run AS even further up at any given output level. If the output gap is persistent, it is going to keep on driving up expectations of inflation. We continually see AS being driven up and further driving inflation upwards. When does it stop shifting up? It will stop shifting up when the output gap is eliminated. So let's say at point four, output is driven back to its potential level and our expectations of inflation at four prime are the same as our actual level of inflation. And this will now seize further upward pressure on our aggregate supply curve. Likewise, when you have recessionary output gaps, they are going to drive down the expectations of inflation. And as expectation of inflation goes down, we are going to have a new short-run aggregate supply curve that is shifting down to reflect this lower expectation of inflation. So persistent positive output gaps will cause a continuous upward shift in your short-run ES, driving inflation upwards whereas recessionary output gaps are going to cause inflation expectations to go down. And if they're persistent, they're going to cause a continuous downward pressure on your short-run AS. So it will continue to shift down. Now, shifting down actually means short-run AS is increasing. So do not confuse the two. Now I'm looking at it as a vertical shift up or a vertical shift down. 